to, 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 to Senator Golden's point, I had met with the local mayor in my area, and uh, they refused to believe it because it was going to lower property tax values. Could you imagine that? People are dying, and they were worried about that. So the stigma's got to go. The stigma has just got to go. We have really, really good people that have just gotten hooked, uh, you know, went down the wrong road. And, you know, everybody makes uh, mistakes in life. People do deserve second chances. And that's the whole idea of us gathering information and being able to reach out to our community and say, listen, this is a problem. We're addressing it. How do we address it? Give us your information. Let's see what we can roll out. Um, as far as the, the, the naloxin kits, uh, it, you know, with CVS, you know, I think they're now over the counter, 497 new CVSs that they're going to give over the counter. I'm cautiously optimistic about that because what I'm hearing out there is that these kids are having farm parties, P-H-A-R-M, and they're going in and they get, a, they, get a, they get a bowl and they throw their pills in the bowl and they're going to go and they're going to say, Okay, Hillary, you're in charge of the uh, Narcan tonight. If one of us go down, you've got to hit us with this. So we're giving them a fail safe, so to speak, a uh, really Russian roulette what they're playing with. And uh, yes, yes, does this save lives? No ands, ifs, and buts about it. It saves lives. I don't want to see that these kids think or these people think that, listen, because I have a Narcan, it's okay for me to, uh, you know, shoot up with the, with the heroin or, or, or take, these, take these pills. So, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about, about having that, you know, over the counter. There's a standing script, you know, with Dr. Zucker, who's our uh, DOH uh, commissioner. Um, you know, he had, uh, which I was surprised that he didn't, really ask the task force, ask any one of us about, uh, you know, what are you hearing out there? What are you seeing out there with regards to the naloxone? We know it's a lifesaver. That's why we put it in our one house bill last year to make sure that we allowed the schools to have this. We allowed our first responders to have, and it just exploded, absolutely exploded. Up to the point where I'm not sure if you know who makes this stuff, and it's a company called Ampstar. The pharmaceutical company that uh, overnight their kit, I believe, went from 1995 to I think it was 89.95, and uh, we had uh, wrote, wrote it, we had written a letter to uh, the Attorney General uh, Schneiderman and asked him to sit down with Mr. Cho, who's the CEO of that, and work up with some sort of agreement. And New York State gets a six dollar rebate for using one of these things. Um, we are putting uh, together a registry to make sure to find out, like Senator Amador said. It is so important for us to have data and figure out where these are being used so we can dial into that area, specifically here in New York City, or specifically in Westchester, specifically in Albany or Erie County. So yeah, these, it, it, it is a lifesaver. No ands, ifs, and buts about it. The stigma's got to come off, that's for sure. Dr. Connors, um, do you believe, do you feel that there's enough treatment in, within the city limits the five boroughs beds types of types of beds and services so um, I think the, a, a couple of things one is um, we do have access to treatment that I know is much more robust than other parts of the state just to acknowledge really a shortage of many services in other parts of the state I think that there's a misconception uh, around what works as addiction treatment and that the only thing that works, I think some families believe and some people believe, is to go far away to inpatient treatment uh, for long periods of time. And the risk there is that people come back to their communities and are exposed to some of the same stressors and problems that were sort of they were caught up in before they left. And so I think a main agenda is to really expand availability of c services and the idea that people can get treatment near, near their homes and in their own communities using a range of modalities. <laughs> One thing that we've been, as you heard from my testimony, really quite preoccupied is making sure access to good pharmacotherapy or medication treatment, which in our field is often yes or no, not what do you need right now at this time. And so. I think our view is that we want to give people every advantage to get the most effective treatment for them at that time. Um, let me j I want to just make one quick comment about the naloxone because I think, um, Senator Murphy, you raised a really important issue that I get a lot of questions about is, 
gee, if we start making naloxone available, are we going to unintentionally cause more drug use or more severe drug use? And I think that's a really important question because we certainly don't want to do that. That's not, that's, sure. we have the opposite agenda. I think that we know from scientific studies, actually, that when you make naloxone widely available in a community, that in fact, at least in some of the studies, drug use actually goes down. Why? People actually think, gee, this is risky, and they're, whoever's giving it to them is educating them about the risks of drug use. And there's some evidence that people use drugs in a safer way, less often, less amount, and so forth. So we haven't seen that increase that I think that you know, many people raise this issue, and we are going to continue to look at that, certainly in the city. Um, and there's lots of good science happening around the country, and so it, we've not seen it so far. The, uh, I know you talked about the uh, long-term care facilities, where the people go away, and the short-term facilities, but part of that is, is, is that teaching and that uh, coming across and getting those uh, people back into community, back into family, is people, places, and things. So they are, they are taught those uh, issues and when they return to their communities and what may happen. Could I have one of those Lachlan sets before you leave, sir? Thank you. You're a great man. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, so the so to me they they do work at, at, at and they they work well, but there was some your testimony here and at which I um, the opiate addiction particularly using methadone and uh, buprenorphine um, decreased mortality. Do we have enough um, um, locations around our city? Did you did your testimony seem to give us an impression that there may not be enough at these locations? So. We, there is capacity in methadone maintenance programs in New York City. What there is not enough capacity is uh, physicians prescribing buprenorphine as part of routine practice in outpatient settings. Because they don't know it? or so, so I would bring us back to uh, partly it's not integrated enough into medical school education, into residency education, and bring us back also to stigma. So doctors are no different than anyone else. Uh, including me, uh, and that stigma affects their own perception of what they do and don't want to take in. And I think we need to work on training and training physicians to think of addiction like other illnesses, a medical illness to be treated. The, uh, on the back end of that, the, the, you mentioned uh, nurses that uh, can prescribe pres prescriptions and are not under the eye stop. Are, are they... Ah, they are under eye stop okay, as well. And, and that would be which two uh, units did you just mention? So nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners. And physician assistants. And okay. so these are medical professionals who are terrific, uh, who are able to prescribe prescription painkillers, yet according to federal prescribing regulation around buprenorphine, not able to treat addiction. Okay. And then I want to go back to the... Um, what about the bad player, the, the, the bad actor, the, the pain management locations that uh, are set up and to give the impression that they are there to take care of methadone or other um, opiate uh, addictions or whatever uh, issue they may have, whether it be a back pain, uh, um, uh, chest pains, leg pains, whatever it may be. The bad player, the bad actor that's out there that has the lines outside his door coming in or her door and uh, getting pain management or um, more prescriptions. Um, what, do we have a, a policy in, in the Department of Health and how we deal with that, uh, with the doctors and with those facilities? So, so regulation, uh, as, the, as Bridget Brennan described, is actually through the State Department of Health, through the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, which is a state health department function and not a city health department function. Okay. So that, that would be where to go with that issue. Okay. Um, and, let me, and let me say, when we, the City Health Department, has taken on educating prescribers, which is, I think, a different, slightly different model, it's not, it's to educate all prescribers to reduce short-term prescribing, use as the minimal amount of opioids as needed 
in order to prevent the develop development of addiction. So we've taken very much a preventive oriented approach to reduce exposure and reduce development of addiction. Is there any state legislation that you need, your agency, uh, in being able to administer your functions and, uh, and do that appropriately? Is there any legislation that you need at the state level? Let me get back to you. If you can, please. The task force is more than willing. Like I said, we'll have it done within six weeks. Uh, the latest two months to three months, we'll have it not only written, drafted, we'll have it passed in the state senate and sent over to the assembly for their um, for their approval and their passage. Um, Victor, I, I haven't. You didn't mention anything about housing. We talked a little bit about treatment, but part of the, I believe, the process of, of treatment, whether it's medically uh, assisted or not, it's what about housing? I'm hearing a lot that there's not that transitional, that sober, that, that safe haven that someone who has go, is going through or just right after can't go home in many cases because of the effects of maybe the influence of friends or family. Um, what's the city doing about that? So I think part of the housing problem is also an affordable housing problem, and I know our administration is very actively working on that. One model that is very promising in terms of connecting housing and, and, and stability for people with addiction is the community residence idea. Um, that is a model, uh, OASIS, this is a state function, has just recently funded a new community residence in Staten Island, and I think that's a great model and example of of how to move to more uh, therapeutically oriented housing uh, for people who need it, who have addictions. Thank you. We're going to go to the audience uh, with the Department of Health, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to uh, deal with the, uh, the, the testimony for Stephanie Campbell from Friends of Recovery. Any questions for the Department of Health and the City of New York from the audience? We got one right here. Hi, my name's Colin Hicks, and um, I'm a recovering heroin addict. Um, I'm in recovery now for two years. I'm two years clean, just about. Congratulations. And thank you. And um, yeah. my question is mainly, um, is it, I want to ask, would it be safe to assume that in the most recent years, the level or the amount, I should say, of uh, Suboxone, Methadone, any of those, um, you know, medically assisted preventative measures um, have increased in the last few years. Those... Do you mean the availability? Yeah. No, not the amounts that they've been used by medical professionals, that they're prescribed, that they're used as a form of treatment. Use the has microphone, increased. please, doctor. Thank you. Uh, methadone, no. There have been some increases in the use of buprenorphine. Uh, yes. Okay, my, my major focus is that um, going off of the previous um, presentation that we saw, the level of heroin abuse and, and uh, overall opiate abuse has done nothing but increase in the recent years um, to a staggering amount. And um, my question more so is uh, maybe outside of your area of, res of responsibility, but <clears throat> I personally believe that too much emphasis may, might be put on this as um, a go-to treatment uh, for something like this. Um, to me, it seems more like, you know, um, an acute treatment for a chronic disease. You know, it doesn't really do much. Um, we talked about eliminating the stigma that surrounds this, and I feel like this, you know, these treatments do nothing but enforce that stigma because instead of going out to seek the help that can really change some of these people's lives, um, they say, oh, well, we can go to the doctor and just take a pill or you can take the Suboxone and it'll go away and you know our families and friends won't have to know about it and you can go on with your life and pretend that this isn't an issue anymore um, when in fact it is an issue. Um, I myself have tried these measures in the past and they did nothing but prolong my abuse and make it to a point where I thought it was a, a, almost acceptable, that I can almost live with it. Um, and it wasn't until I got to the point where I had to embrace the idea that uh, complete abstinence was the only way possible to get over this. And obviously I had to eliminate some stigma issues in my life in order to do that. Um, but I think that 
you know, we can all agree that that stigma is one of the biggest things that stands in the way of, of us really attacking this, this, this issue head on. And um, in, in my opinion, um, I really think that these things are some of the things that stand in the way of eliminating that stigma. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your, thank you for your dedication and sticking with it. And you, you have a community supporting you all around. Isn't it much better that clean life, not having to work, worry about it, getting up in the morning? Don't you feel great? Doesn't you enjoy life better today? You smell that air, you smell the roses, you feel great about yourself, and your friends and your family love you, and they always did. You just, at some point, let yourself down and let your family down, but you found your way home. God bless you. God bless you. Doctor, you had one more uh, thing I want to ask you is the... Um, you said that you've seen a rise in heroin uh, before the uh, eye stop. Uh, how much of a rise did you see in that? And when, when did the... Uh... I can't speak year, I don't have the year by year statistics. I think that we uh, believe that, as, and you've heard this story today, is people get exposed to prescription painkillers, develop an addiction, uh, find their way to heroin, which is sometimes available. It's the same, at, yeah cheaper and so that progression regardless of eye stop was beginning to happen in New York City and other places but we know this from the rise in mortality from heroin even before eye stop actually went into effect a lot of people wouldn't recognize it they just went into effect the uh, but it, I'm glad it's working uh, at least on the prescription uh, portion of this the opiates uh, the uh, um, Vicodin and uh, other pill forms, but heroin is definitely uh, ripping our communities apart and our families, and we have to do something about it. And again, I want to thank you, Doctor, for all the good work. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Doctor. Stephanie uh, Campbell from the uh, Friends of Recovery, uh, please. Okay. Um, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Senator Golden. Uh, for the opportunity to be here and to present testimony. Thank you to Senator Amador for the extraordinary work that he and his colleague, um, Senator Murphy, are doing in the Senate um, and in really um, hearing us and um, working on this issue. I'm Stephanie Campbell, and as the Director of Policy for Friends of Recovery New York, I'm honored to be here uh, at today's hearing to discuss how we can address the public health crisis of addiction in New York State. Friends of Recovery New York represents the voice of individuals and families living in recovery from addiction, families who have lost a family member, or Please. people who have been otherwise impacted by addiction. Uh, the stigma, as we've heard, and shame that surrounds addiction has prevented millions of individuals and family members from seeking help. Uh, For New York is dedicated to breaking down the barriers created by stigma that result in discrimination and policies that block or interfere with recovery, which includes access to treatment, addiction treatment, health care, housing, education, and employment. But I'm also Stephanie Campbell, who's a person in long-term recovery. And what that means is that I've not used alcohol or drugs in over 15 years. Um, recovery. <laughs> Recovery has given me the opportunity to be a wife, a mother, an employee, a New York State taxpayer, instead of a tax strain, who gives back to her community. I've gotten three master's degrees uh, as the result of um, my not using drugs. I'll take one of them. <laughs> um, we'll talk. And, um, and I'm just extraordinarily grateful for this gift. I went from being a homeless street kid on, on St. Mark's Place. Um, that didn't have a home uh, and didn't have a life to being who I am today. And so I'm extraordinarily grateful uh, for that. So as you know, heroin use, we've been talking about that, and prescription and opiate abuse are having devastating effects on public health and safety in New York State. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently announced that drug overdoses now surpass automobile accidents as the leading cause of injury-related deaths for Americans between the ages of 25 and 64. Every day, more than 129 Americans die as a result of drug overdoses, and over half of those deaths are related to prescription drugs. And last month, as we heard in Buffalo, 
23 people perished from drug overdoses. At one of our recent four New York recovery talks, Bridget Brennan, who you heard from earlier today, um, noted that while heroin overdose deaths affect white neighborhoods as never before, in New York City, the worst damage is found in communities that have suffered the longest. The highest rate of heroin overdose deaths is in Hunts Point, Mott Haven, in the Bronx, where the problem is not new. And yet, in contrast, a Staten Island community, once untouched by heroin, is second highest. So we know that addiction does not discriminate. It knows no bounds of race, ethnicity, creed, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, or lack of religion. It impacts those from Park Avenue to Park Bench. And so as this epidemic is multifaceted, so must be our response. As a member of the recovery community, I know that my voice and my experience is invaluable because I've found an effective solution to my struggle with addiction. Unfortunately, thousands of people have not been able to access recovery because there simply are not enough dollars and resources for recovery services for individuals and families. And while countless hearings have been going on across the state, recommendations calling for the same resounding need of additional dollars to the New York State budget appear to have been ignored. Little is being done to address the overwhelming evidence that shows that community-based recovery services and peer supports are needed to help individuals with addiction build and sustain their recovery. Given this urgency, I call on our leaders in the legislature and the governor's office to take immediate actions to address the current addiction crisis in New York State. We must see an immediate increase in funding to the OASIS budget by a minimum of $50 million that would be an investment in recovery. And I know that sounds like $50 million. It's a drop in the bucket. And we've heard folks talk about addiction being treated as a crisis. And so once folks get out of, if they're lucky enough to get into treatment, and they get out of treatment, they go back into their communities, and there's no support available. So we're setting them up to fail. So I just want to reiterate that. So the money that we're asking for would, would fund recovery organizations and centers. It would fund the implementation of recovery coaches and family support navigators in every county across the state. It would help individuals and families across New York State who are not accessing critical life-saving treatment get the help that they need. Right now, we have an army of people with lived experience, individuals in recovery, family members in recovery, and families who have lost someone to addiction, ready, willing, and able to provide the recovery infrastructure desperately needed in their communities across the state. Infrastructure similar to what is being provided in places like the Brooklyn Community Recovery Center, which is a community responsive, peer-driven support center that provides recovery services. They facilitate referrals, they mobilize resources, they link individuals to community social supports that assist people in their recovery from addiction, as well as other recovery issues. But they and thousands of individuals and family members impacted by addiction need your investment to do so. We see that solution to the addiction crisis lies in increased funding, legislation, and policies that sustain recovery, support health and civic engagement for individuals and families affected by addiction. I've sat in the same rooms as you in numerous hearings across the state. And in each of these hearings, we've heard the same thing that simply there isn't enough dollars and resources being invested in the solution of recovery. The end result is that people who get out of treatment are not getting the community services and supports they need to keep them from relapsing back into active use. And too often, they die. We need to act now before another 23 families in Brooklyn, in Buffalo, or any other community across New York State lose another loved one to the chronic, treatable disease of addiction. Thank you for your time. Stephanie, for, uh, just for on the record, full disclosure in the audience, uh, Stephanie Campbell has been such an instrumental advocate for not just for New York and the recovery, everyone in recovery. You heard her story. This is someone who 
who lives, who has had a uh, horrible past, but such an astonishing and, and successful uh, present and great future because of her experience. And she has literally gone to just about every single task force hearing that we have had throughout the state. It seems like sometimes we're bumper to bumper going to these things. <laughs> and her story just keeps going and she has made such a huge impact in so many people. I have, I've spoken to individuals who are hardcore users who sometimes they'll come to a task force um, hearing and they will testify and they will share and what can we do? How can, how can we in the state legislature help someone who is actively using and she listens and she doesn't speak every single time and publicly testify like she did today but um, I have watched her after uh, individuals speak and the amount of care and the and the and the hugs and the service that I know that she's helping with those individuals is making a huge difference and so I want to thank you for that Stephanie and to your point and your request, you know, I sometimes think that your $50 million asked to, for uh, the increase to OASIS is way too small because it takes so much more. And this is a large state. And just think about, just Brooklyn alone, $50 million, and there's many providers here, and, and even the, the doctor with, representing the health department in the city would say, man, that's just a drop in a bucket. Uh, we in the Senate are um, working on and asking for, I believe, even much more than that. Let's see where, where it goes and what we can do. Um, but again, it's a multi-pronged approach. And I have, uh, and I'm sure that there's family members in, in the room, in the audience uh, today, this afternoon, who wish that they could have a a uh, family support navigator, a navigator alongside of them. Uh, and they don't know where to go. What is a family support navigator? Uh, and that, that service alone, that coach or that, um, that mentor is so crucial, I believe, for an, an entire family to just make each step day by day and how they can cope but how they can overcome the stronghold in their family's life. And it can, as we heard that young gentleman right there, um, overcome. And so uh, I love to hear the victories and the testimony. And, uh, you know, it gives me a great deal of, of motivation to continue on this fight because it's a hard uphill battle. But all of us together, can make a big difference in this. So thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you very much for your testimony. If you could leave your testimony behind, we'd like to have that as part of the uh, um, testimony for the, uh, and I hope we got the other testimony from the previous.